Uh, we're here today at the Sun with uh, Maura Healy. Uh, she's running for the, uh, uh, the state attorney general as a Democrat. Uh, very successful primary campaign. We're very happy to have you back here, Maura. Uh, we'd like you to, uh, to give us uh, a little update on, um, on the interim, what's uh, transpired between the primary and uh, basically some of the top uh, issues that concern you in, uh, in this race. Great. Well, look, it's great to be back here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to sit with all of you here at the Lowell Sun. Um, you know, we've come through uh, a tough primary. I had a tough opponent, and I think that the public had an opportunity through a series of debates, including our very first debate, which was here in Lowell, thank you, um, to really air the issues. And I'm um, obviously thrilled with the result of the primary and the win, but uh, we're very much on to this general election and, uh, and continuing to make the case to the voters. And the case I make to the voters as a lawyer um, is that I want to be an attorney general who's there to fight for people here in the state, and who's there to advocate uh, for Massachusetts and enforce the law. It's very important to me that we have somebody as attorney general who brings experience and independence to the position, and I think that I bring both. For the last seven years, uh, I've been in the Attorney General's office on the front lines. I was Chief of the Civil Rights Division and then head of two of the major bureaus with oversight of half of the attorneys and staff in that office across a wide range of industry and, and areas and sectors that the Attorney General's office covers. And so I bring with me firsthand direct experience, both uh, substantive experience and also leadership and management experience in that office, understanding the powers, the authority, the tools of that office, um, and will be able to do so effectively as Attorney General. I also bring an independence with me. I've never run for office. I never fancied myself a politician. But I ran for this office because I believe that I can be uh, the best Attorney General for the people here in this state. Uh, I also came through a primary where I did not benefit from endorsements from uh, much of the political establishment and really had to make the case to the voters on my own. And so I think that leaves me uniquely situated to, to bring with me the independence that's needed to do that job uh, as well as I'd like to do it. Um, In terms of the issues, too, I'd like to address those. Um, you know, I continue to talk about the need to have an attorney general who's there to be a strong consumer advocate to protect people here in the state. We've got escalating health care costs and energy costs. We have people whose wages need to be protected. We have senior citizens who need to be uh, looked after, and, and we need to hold people accountable when they take advantage of, of seniors um, or other vulnerable populations. Uh, we need uh, an advocate who's going to stand up for, for children, uh, people with disabilities, and I will do that, um, and really lead with transparency and accountability. One of the things that I've talked about, too, uh, a great deal, and I've spoken with a number of folks in the Lowell area, is my real desire to crack down and end gun violence, gang violence, and some of the problems we're seeing in Lowell and, and elsewhere across the state. And I think that as Attorney General, uh, using the tools of that office, working with others in law enforcement, working with folks in the community and other uh, elected officials, we can make some progress. And so that's something I've spent a lot of time talking about in this campaign as well. Um, so there are a lot of issues out there, a lot of things that I want to embrace and, and take on, um, and, uh, and so I'm here today to ask for, ask for the endorsement and hopefully over the next five weeks earn the support of the voters here in the state. With all these issues, are you, are you, putting, uh, are you changing the direction of the Attorney General's office? One thing that the, your, uh, your, your rival for this, uh, for this uh, position has said is that he just wants to be the, the Attorney General. He's, he, he says that you have an agenda for a higher office. He says, look at her website, look at these issues. He says that she's raising that, uh, you know, an attorney general should basically enforce the law and protect the, the people of Massachusetts as best as they possibly, uh, she, she or he possibly can. What do you, what do you think about that, uh, that charge made by your opponent? Well, I'm running for Attorney General. That's the only thing I'm running for and the only thing I want to be. Um, and I think the agenda I put forth, including all the policies that I set out uh, on my website, are areas that relate directly to the work of the Attorney General's office. I know that because I've come out of that office and, uh, and understand that the Attorney General has a role to play when it comes to protecting consumers, tackling domestic violence, fighting sexual assault on campus, 
ending gun violence and violence among youths, you know, in particular in our communities, um, taking on uh, consumer issues, fighting for ratepayers when it comes to energy costs, um, lowering, working to lower health care uh, costs. This is all part and parcel of the work of the Attorney General from a law enforcement perspective, from a regulatory oversight perspective. There are certain responsibilities that the Attorney General has and ways that the Attorney General needs to act to protect people here in the state. So, you know, I think I've tried, what I've tried to do is set up pretty concretely uh, the role that, that I uh, would play in, in exercising and carrying out that very responsibility. So you wouldn't use this position as Attorney General as a stepping stone to a higher office? That's, that's what you're pledging right now? No, absolutely not. I mean, I, I you know, I've said, um, uh, I, I was asked a few weeks ago, would you ever run for anything else? And I answered candidly, I don't, I don't take pledges for the sake of taking pledges because I've seen a lot of politicians break them. <laughs> um, but I want to be clear with folks that uh, I am running for Attorney General because I want to be the people's lawyer. I want to be the, the Attorney General here in the state, and uh, um, and that is the only thing uh, I am running for. Let's pretend you're the Attorney General today, that you've been elected, mm -hmm. okay? And National Grid came before you for a 31 percent rate increase. 37. 37. 37, yeah. Which to me is just uncomfortable. What would be your response to that, and what would you do to try to be, um, to, as, you, as you've said, to have consumers yeah. It, it, you know, you've mentioned the consumer advocacy part of the job. I think right. even more than you have the law enforcement. So, what would, okay. what would your response to National Grid be? Yeah, well, Chris, you know, if, if that happened, uh, that's a decision. Well, you know, one part of it's happening. Well, <laughs> so you know, this goes right to to the heart of an area of attorney general input and and uh, and and exercise. And so, the attorney general actually has a division called the Office of Ratepayer Advocacy where your job is to represent rate, rate payers, you and me, consumers, customers, businesses across the state who are going to be hit with bills, utility bills, and to take positions in support of, of, of rate payer interests. And so, you know, in that instance, typically what happens is there's a docket opened at the Department of Public Utilities in the Attorney General's office. I, if elected, I would have my teams uh, be uh, looking and, into and the merits of it and what's behind it, um, providing transparency. Uh, to the public on that and making sure that we are doing everything possible to hold costs down. What I mean, that has been the traditional you, role you, of, of the Attorney the press, General. What was, your, what was your reaction to that? When well, you saw that? Well, uh, look, it's, I mean, this is, a, this is a problem for us here in the, in the Northeast. We've got yeah. rising energy costs. Um, we know it's an expensive place to live because of how cold it is in the winter and how warm it can get in the summer. And so, you know, energy costs, I think, is something that we've been battling and dealing with as a state um, and as consumers for some time. But my first inclination would be, let me get my hands on the information as to what is contributing to that mm -hmm. charge and that proposed increase. Um, you know, there are certain um, components that have to deal with the distribution. There are certain components that just have to do with the base cost. Um, I want to know more about what it is that's baked into that proposed uh, increase and and you know the job of the attorney general, as I say, is to really vet that and to provide transparency and to do the hard look so that we know that we're doing all that we can to protect consumers. The, the attorney general ultimately has to sign off on that, right? Actually, the executive office, the Department of Public Utilities, and the attorney general stands as an advocate, as an actual party okay. in that proceeding. Mm -hmm. um, in this instance, the party advocating for measures to protect consumers. The the uh, the partners deal more and more has has uh, surfaced in this um, uh, election on the gubernatorial level uh, because of uh, you know you know Martha, Martha Coakley's involvement in in, in that uh, but uh, it, it seems like it's going to come down to one judge to decide whether this thing was was fair or not and whether we start over again. You've been critical of that settlement haven't you in the past and uh, you know I've expressed skepticism about okay. aspects of that um, and one thing I was um, also saying early was that you know it's important to have this public process that we've had where the comments have been submitted and we've you know the, the judge in the court will have an opportunity to take stock and now the office I think has gone back and modified uh, the agreement and strengthened it in some ways um, and now that's before the court but if, if you were the attorney general and, and the, the, the judge decides that this, this was a good settlement, okay, for the state, all right, would you have any uh, issue with reopening it at all to look into it uh, from, 
from your own perspective? You know, so... Uh, and I just say this because every politician, Democrat and Republican, except Martha Coakley, who's come in here, has expressed mm -hmm. that same skepticism, and some have been critical, and, uh, and, and the, the hospital, I was with the ho uh, hospital people on, on Friday, they are very, very concerned about what that's going to do to Lowell General and other community hospitals. They just see a, 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 a big um, uh, conglomerate there uh, just sucking up everything in the future. So I think that's why it was important to have this public comment period where um, there was a lot of input from entities after that proposed consent judgment was filed. And I've only read the revised proposed uh, consent judgment very, very briefly, but it does strengthen um, the, the proposal, and I think that that's what I'm trying to get my arms around right now. Um, and that followed both comments and also a report by the Health Policy Commission. I'll tell you my perspective and what I do is, as Attorney General, my view is that the Attorney General should do everything um, in her power to make sure that we're driving down costs. I will do that using the tools of the office, using antitrust tools, using not-for-profit uh, oversight, uh, using consumer protection oversight. Um, if the court enters this uh, consent judgment, um, my job will be to enforce it, to make it work. There are provisions in there that provide for comprehensive monitoring um, and, and, a, and, a, and a continual and constant look and examination, and that's the kind of rigor I'm going to bring to this, because, you know, I think this is an agreement um, uh, and this relates to, to this particular uh, partner's proposal. Um, but, you know, there's, this is a, a dynamic market, and I can't think of any um, area that's going to require more sort of vigilance and attention by the next Attorney General than the, the health care market space. Well, one of the provisions in this settlement is that oversight is provided through the Attorney General's mm -hmm. office, but it doesn't specify just exactly how that, how that is going to work. I mean, you, you said it yourself, just how, how large this, the, mm -hmm. this is, and it seems like Partners has the leverage because there's going to be so many areas, you'd probably have half your, half your staff uh, trying to, uh, uh, to provide uh, the necessary oversight for this. So any thoughts, that, I mean, that, that's going to be a challenge for how you come up with, uh, uh, I mean, are you, are you willing to devote a division? Uh, is there a division now that looks at these <coughs> health care uh, issues? And, and, yeah. and there are actually three divisions that, that look at this, the health care division, the antitrust division, the not-for-profit division, and um, a tremendous number of resources from all three divisions have been at this the last four and a half years, along with the U.S. Department of Justice, mm -hmm. conducting this investigation. And, um, you know, I know that the teams in that office worked very hard to put on the table and exact some things through a proposed uh, agreement that might otherwise not have been attainable through uh, an antitrust lawsuit. I think that's you know, what's been talked about. The question now, though, is this. Is what is out there in terms of the proposed consent judgment enough? Does it do enough? There were some changes. For example, one of the changes um, in the new agreement is that the same cap's going to be in place when it comes to the Hallmark hospitals. And so the real question, you know, there, there are questions now about whether the, the different proposed changes that are included are enough, or do we need to do more? That's what I'm focused on and looking at, um, and that's what's going to be the subject of review uh, and discussion and ultimately hearing he here in November. Another thing on health But I will be prepared to, 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 to have the tools and the resources in place, Jim, to make sure that we are doing everything we can to drive down costs. The agreement, uh, to the extent something like it stays in place, the monitoring component does allow the hiring and the bringing on, um, paid for by the hospital, um, of, of uh, experts and others uh, who will be there to, to provide additional resources to, to provide that vigilance. I just have a quick follow-up on that. But if you were the Attorney General today, would you have approved that deal with all these conditions? And I think I asked you the same question right. when you were here last time. I'm not sure you answered it. Well, my, my answer was that I don't know anything more than you all know in terms of the facts and what's out there in terms of what the investigation revealed. This back last October I during the course of this, so I don't know, I'm not privy to but all Mara, the facts But you're an intelligent woman. You know, sure. you know the landscape. As, as Jim said earlier, politician after politician came in here, have come in here and um, expressed 
um, disenchantment with this deal. What, what about you? I mean, just cut, yes, yes or no, do you think that this was a good deal? I think that's Should what we're testing. Should partners have been held up? I think that it was good that they, they, there was a look back at it now, um, that, that the Health Policy Commission had an opportunity to evaluate and weigh in on the Hallmark transactions, and that the offices now, I think as they've said themselves, had an opportunity to go back and reevaluate and include some additional provisions. Um, and, and that's, you know, really what we're trying to test now and see. I, I know this, Chris, that regardless of what this judge decides to do with this agreement, this is going to be an area where this is just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to, to what is happening to health care costs and, and the market. And it's an area that I am absolutely committed to, to bringing to bear all the resources um, on to get this right and working with the Health Policy Commission, working with others in the market, uh, working with the next governor on because, I mean, this is an issue that affects families, it affects employers, um, affects businesses um, in, in huge and significant ways. But I really want to know, I'll try one more time, would you have said no to this deal? I can't answer that question based yes, on... See, yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. It would be irresponsible for me to answer that question absent knowing what the facts were that were before the Attorney General's office over the last year. I do know that this was a four and a half year investigation and that what the remedy was in terms of an antitrust remedy versus what was set out in the agreement, there were some innovative and creative attempts to uh, include some terms that, that wouldn't otherwise have been included as a result of any antitrust lawsuit. And so I commend the teams in the office for that. I just don't know that it's enough. Um, I don't know, for example, that the term of years is enough or that the price cap is enough. Um, but believe me, this is one thing in the midst of this general campaign, I am really doing my best to uh, read through the agreement. As I said, I've just read through uh, the agreement briefly, the proposed new agreement, um, as well as the comments that have come in. Um, mm -hmm. And I will do everything I can um, to be up to speed on this and be ready to act as Attorney General if elected. It, it just seems odd that after four and a half years of investigation and uh, that we don't know if partners violated anything or didn't violate it. And if they did violate it, because if they were a corporation, and even though they're a nonprofit, seems like there would have been a fine or someone would have been paying something for, for doing so, something. So, so uh, I think more and more as, as this thing is surfacing, it's, it, people are wondering, uh, why do you expend four and a half years into an investigation? And basically, things are staying the same, although the rule book is being rewritten. And I think that's what has people really concerned because they see their premiums going up every, uh, uh, you know, every uh, every time they have to re up their their, their health care uh, uh, premiums, and when they go to the hospital, they feel the pain. So mm -hmm. it, it just seems like uh, uh, that uh, this uh, partners was, in my view, was given a pass. They well, a pass. I mean, in terms of um, there not being a finding, I think that was the question of the decision you know, before the Attorney General's office. Do you take it to trial before a judge in this instance and let the judge make a decision, make a determination whether there was a violation? You can make your case. As is often the case um, with investigations, not every case goes to trial and, and sometimes you end up with a filing of a complaint and a proposed uh, resolution in the form of a consent judgment and that's what we saw here. So that's not uncommon um, in terms of a, a resolution, but the question is, are the terms adequate? Are they sufficient for protecting the public interest? And, you know, that's what's being vetted now and considered by this judge who's asked for some more time to consider it, take some more comment, um, and have another hearing on it. So, you know, as I said at the outset, you know, I expressed skepticism, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the, with the earlier uh, agreement, aspects of it. I also understand that um, there are aspects of that agreement that are included that otherwise weren't included by way of an antitrust lawsuit. So, you know, uh, as I say, I'm committed, you know, going forward to um, ensuring as Attorney General, if elected, that we will have the resources in place and that I will provide a rigorous examination of anything related to, to health care costs because, you know, this is, uh, as you say, um, this is a huge issue for families, individuals. Um, businesses here in the state. Our health care is, you know, among the most expensive in the country. Sticking well, with the health, sticking to yeah. health care, 
tw uh, about 24 months ago, the Massachusetts congressional delegation sent a letter uh, to the President of the United States and the Health and Human Services to get a waiver, okay, for Massachusetts on exemptions from certain uh, 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 Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement costs and, and things that are going to make our uh, plan more costly than other parts of the country. Uh, and, and some of the exemptions were the same that Nancy Pelosi got for her district mm -hmm. in, in California. Six months ago, the president, uh, uh, the, the governor of Massachusetts, finally got around to sending a similar letter for the exemptions, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and to this day, we still have not heard from the government what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. If we do not get those exemptions that are going to uh, uh, harm the, the, uh, the, the health care industry of this, this state, is it up to, the, does it behoove the, the next Attorney General to possibly sue the, uh, the United States uh, uh, government uh, for the same exemptions that other um, governments uh, in, in, the, in the country have been given, or do we just keep the status quo? Wow. Well, look, I mean, um, you know, my, my perspective as Attorney General is I'll use all the power and tools of that office to do what I think is right by the people here in the state and what is right by Massachusetts. And at times, um, that's meant suing the federal government. We did that when it came to the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, that was a case that I was personally involved in and had some success. Uh, we did that a while ago when we took on George Bush's administration. Um, I was not in the office at the time, but the uh, former attorney general sued uh, with regard to, to greenhouse gases. So you know, I think that everything should be on the table in terms of what are the tools and powers of that office that you're going to use and then make good judgments uh, about how you're going to exercise that authority and those tools. In terms of this specific issue, um, you know, I'd, like anything else, I'd have to evaluate the merits of the case that we could make and the evidence that we could marshal to go about it. Is but you the better believe it. If people are hurting here and are unlawfully or unfairly denied uh, access mm -hmm. to something, then I'm going to be fighting for people here in the state. Very good. Well, that's come down to your being independent doesn't matter who's in the White House, you're going to do what, what you think is best for the citizens of Massachusetts. It doesn't matter who's in the White House, absolutely. It doesn't matter who's in any house. I mean, it, that, that's my charge. Uh, that would be my charge as Attorney General, you know, to represent the public, represent the public interest, uh, and to do it carefully and thoughtfully with independence, with judgment. Um, and that's why I'm running, because I, I think that, you know, mine has been a career through private practice as a business litigator. Uh, as a special assistant district attorney, as an assistant uh, attorney general, and, and a leader in the current attorney general's office, I think that I have uh, the experience to lead an office of 500 people who are working day in and day out to try to make a positive difference in people's lives here. Can I ask, why did you leave private practice to go into <laughs> the middle 68's office? And I'd like to know where you work in the middle 68's office. I left it to go, well, I left it to go to the middle DA's office um, because I wanted to get uh, more in-court trial experience. Okay. And then I went back, it was a, it was a rotation where I was there uh, and then went back to um, private practice oh, at the okay. law firm Hale and Door. Okay. I then okay. left Hale and Dorf were good in 2007 after eight terrific years of, yeah. of litigation um, because I had an opportunity to, to be a public interest lawyer in the Attorney General's office. I, uh, some would say it was uh, a little unusual, but I happily took the 70% pay cut uh, to leave Hale and Dorf, which is a great firm, to become Chief of the Civil Rights Division because that's really where my, uh, my heart was and, and how I wanted to use my uh, legal uh, uh, legal skills at that time, and in time, you know, ended up becoming chief of the Public Protection Bureau and the Business and Labor Bureau. Just out of curiosity, what courts were you in in, in district uh, in Middlesex? Somerville and Cambridge. Okay. Who was the DA? Who did you work with? Um, the DA then was Martha Copeland. Martha. Yeah. I didn't know her. Um, I didn't meet her during my time in, in mm -hmm. as a special assistant. I was only there for a yeah. short period of time, mm -hmm. um, but um, but I was in Somerville and Cambridge District Court and then uh, back at, at Hale and Door and then over to the Attorney General's office. How long were you at the Attorney General's office? Seven years. <coughs> seven years. Just about, just shy of seven years. And you left there to run for this office? Yes. So you left the Attorney General's office to run for Attorney General? Yes. Okay. I don't know that that... 
<laughs> I don't, yeah, and I don't know when, when that was last done. Uh -huh. um, I was, you know, as they say, I was chief of, of uh, then two bureaus uh, at the time, last fall, um, when I realized that, 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 and understood the current attorney general, Martha Kofi, was running for governor, uh -huh. and that meant that there was going to be an open seat. And as I say, I'm not somebody who thought or planned to run for political office, but uh, I view the attorney general's office as uh, a unique office where you have the ability to run a, a, a public law firm um, and you know serve the people here in the state. And I just found it very compelling and something that I thought I was well suited for uh -huh. based on my experience. So I resigned from the office last fall to run for attorney general. And I've been out on the trail ever since. Okay, I'm changing. Oh, I have a question on law enforcement. Um, okay. I had a conversation with the local police chief about a week ago, mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about um, th this past summer where Lowell has uh, seen just a tremendous amount of gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, just random shots in the middle of the night, cars getting shot up. Mm -hmm. He attributed mostly to um, thugs who are running, running drugs. It's become a criminal enterprise for them, running drugs. And he said the biggest drug. The most, the most popular drug that they're running right now is marijuana. And he said the worst thing that the state of Massachusetts ever did was decriminalize, um, you know, having like an ounce or less of marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree with that? Do you, do you think that, that that was a bad move on, beha on behalf of the state? Um, and, or should, should any amount of marijuana still be a criminal offense? Well, uh, you know, my perspective is the law is in place and my job is to make it work and protect public safety. Yes, There's I a question yeah. about you know, decriminalization. I have not supported decriminalization beyond what we have in place right now um, because there, there's active debate about that. You look at what's going on in, in Washington, in Colorado, um, and, I, and I don't support decriminalization because I have real concerns about addiction. That said, you know, uh, drug use, drug trafficking, it's interesting to hear about marijuana. I've, you know, I've heard um, a lot about heroin. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that is throughout communities mm -hmm. across the state, the drug right now that is just absolutely ravaging communities and families. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I came out with a plan to combat <coughs> heroin abuse, uh, heroin use uh, and trafficking and prescription drug mm -hmm. abuse mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I see these, these things really, really damaging um, infrastructure, communities, families, individuals, and I've talked before, uh, part of my criminal justice reform plan calls for, you know, doing more to amplify services for drug and substance abuse treatment because, you know, we just have these folks who continue to uh, revolve through our community courts um, who, you know, continue to recidivate, who, who just aren't going to get out of it absent access to, to treatment and services. I've also um, spent time talking to police chiefs and district attorneys um, about how we together can better combat gun trafficking and drug trafficking because oftentimes gun and drug trafficking mm -hmm. uh, run together along with human trafficking actually too which is also you know an issue so I am really committed to uh, doing everything I can to work in concert with them to get after um, drug trafficking and gun trafficking and I know it's a problem here in Lowell uh, as it is in other communities. Um, I also want to work with other states. You know, we're not that far from the border. I grew up um, near Hampton, New Hampshire, and I think it's really important to have working relationships, and I will certainly work to do that uh, as Attorney General, working with state partners uh, in surrounding states, uh, be it New Hampshire or Connecticut, where some of these drugs are coming up, um, the, the I-91 pipeline in the corridor there, um, whatever it takes. Uh, to get at this issue. If you were Attorney General, what specifically, what specific steps would you take to um, uh, prevent the, the, the um, distribution of illegal guns? Uh, of illegal guns? Yes. Well, I think there are a few I mean, there's things. There's so much lip service. The legislature just passed something. Yeah. Um, there's been so much lip service, but it doesn't really seem to have much of an impact. Well, I hope this new legislation will actually have an impact because I think it is getting illegal guns off the streets, mm -hmm. which is the real problem here. And so that's one thing I'm looking to, to really support and help implement. Mm -hmm. It just got passed. It's just now in the, in, in the first stage of implementation. 
you know, getting the databases talking to one another, getting us signed up for the National Background Criminal Background Database, um, which is a way of making sure that guns don't get into the hands of people who aren't supposed to have them. Um, sending investigators, troopers into hotspots where there is gun trafficking and ready trade, you know, so the departments have more support in, in cracking down mm -hmm. on, on gun trafficking. Um, helping them, you know, with resources so they can better trace crimes and, and, and gun activity. Um, these are very real things. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time, I did two, the last two weeks I was uh, in Chelsea uh, with a group uh, that included the police chief and the city manager and an anti-gang group similar to UTEC here in Lowell where, you know, combined forces so that, you know, you're understanding where the guns are coming from and, um, and can better come together to take action to, to get them out of the homes and off the streets. Um, I did a similar program out in Worcester uh, last week. You know, so this is something that I'm really committed to, and I think there are some really concrete ways through this new legislation um, to, to make this happen. It's also going to require work with uh, other states, um, particularly when you look at the ease with which people are able to obtain guns, say, in New Hampshire, where I grew up. Um, and so, you know, again, that's an area that I really want to work with other state authorities on. Going back to your seven years in the AG's office, was there anything while that you learned or that you saw there that said, if I become AG, I'd like to change this, these workforce policies or anything uh, inside that office to make it, uh, to improve it or make it better? Was there anything in those seven years that you said, if I become AG, this is what I'm going to do. Well, um, there are a couple of things. You know, one thing that I think is really important that I've seen is the real need to uh, be outside of just Boston. And uh, I've talked about amplifying resources in other communities. We, the Attorney General currently has offices in Worcester and in Springfield mm -hmm. and in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. But um, I think where we can, you know, grow a presence and make sure that, you know, people have an opportunity to have their complaints heard uh, and a place to turn to and that there's an AG presence in a community that's there for community meetings, it's there to work with city leaders, it's there to work with police uh, or organizations as a resource. It's a people's law firm. I want to do that, Jim. I also um, uh, proposed something new, hadn't been done before, a child and youth protection division in the office because, you know, it's been my observation looking at what's happened with, with DCF and some of our state agencies. Um, that we need to do a better job when it comes to the care and delivery of services and the protection of kids. And even within the Attorney General's office, I saw that there was some siloed activity. We did a little child bullying here, child trafficking here, um, uh, child pornography work here, advice to the Department of Children and Families here. And instead of having that be siloed, where there may be a tendency to work in a vacuum, let's bring it together under one house not more resources, but just a, a changing, a shifting of, of resources so that you're better able to, you know, um, work together and deliver care more comprehensively. So you would create a division focused yeah. on that. Yeah, that, I've called for creating a division focused on that, absolutely. Um, you know, and another thing that I've talked about is I want to be an attorney general who works proactively with our state agencies to get policies uh, and practices in place that are right, that are working. Um, I'd rather not be dealing with things on the back end once they're broke and there's a lawsuit filed where we can proactively, uh, and I know this from my days in private litigation, where you can proactively work with a client to make sure that they've got in right place the right kinds of uh, practices. Um, I want to do that, and so I want to make sure that there is good communication between the Attorney General, who acts as legal counsel to state agencies. Uh, to head off problems and to, so that we prophylactically uh, are doing things, you know, on the front end. I think that's good for taxpayers. Um, and I think it's, it's good when it comes to uh, the work of, of agencies and their ability to serve the public. Do you think any of the, um, any of the big controversies, the DCF or the, the compounding, they could have been headed off if there was that kind of attention that you just talked about? I don't know, but, you know, I do know that uh, it's something we should be doing. Um, I look at the situation with the Department of Corrections, for example, um, where, you know, uh, not too long ago we had a, a young man with a mental illness who was in the care and custody of DOC.
corrections officers who maybe haven't been trained on how to properly care for a person with a mental illness. Um, and, you know, he ended up dead. Um, and, you know, it's those kinds of things that I, that I want to look at and, and head off. Um, would that person have been better off in the care and custody of the Department of Mental Health, for example, right? And these are the kinds of, of, of things that I want to make sure we're doing right um, as a legal matter, um, uh, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as Attorney General uh, for people here in the state. Okay, I have to drill down on this, uh, going back to the office. In your seven years of, uh, in that office, uh, uh, are you happy that, when you were in there in the seven years, were you happy that there was gender equality, pay equality, and ethnic diversity among the staff? Was I satisfied? No. That's all we, you, we always want to do better. Um, I know it's something that I strive to do uh, as a manager. I think it's something that the Attorney General's Office strive to do. But, you know, obviously there's more work to do there. And in, in what I'm specific curious. areas? And wh where would you, where would you Im improve? improve? Uh, because uh, you go on the Attorney General's mm -hmm. website, or you go, on, you, know, you go on the State of Massachusetts website, and you look at the breakdown for the, the, for the 600 people who work in that uh, office. Mm -hmm. there, there are, I don't know why there is, but there are inequalities, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I'm just kind of surprised by that, that this has become an issue in, in this campaign uh, for several offices, not, not necessarily your campaign, but in several offices and stuff. And in the Attorney General's office, I mean, maybe there are reasons for it. I don't know. I don't know how they, how they hire and stuff. But do you, are you satisfied? You, you, said, you just said you weren't necessarily satisfied with everything in those seven years. So what specifically was it, and what would you do to improve some of those? Well, I think that, you know, the Attorney General's office, as with any public entity, agency, it, it, it's, uh, it's belongs to the public. And, you know, I'm really committed to having an Attorney General's office that reflects the, uh, the complexion, the circumstance of people here in the state. And I'll tell you that, um, you know, I think that, you know, there are a few things I'd like to do um, as Attorney General if elected <coughs> to uh, try to better ensure that we have that diversity when it comes to race, uh, gender, uh, you know, just experience. Um, and that's important too, a diversity of experience and what you bring to, to, to the office. My goal um, is to have uh, in place the best and the brightest in terms of talent, secretaries, paralegals, investigators, assistant attorneys generals. That's what I want. That's what I think the people of Massachusetts deserve. But I'm going to be active in recruiting uh, and making sure that we have a diversity uh, across all those uh, points that I just mentioned because I think that's important to people having in place a people's law firm. Um, I'd like to institute uh, a high school job program for kids so that they get acclimated to the work of the Attorney General's office and hopefully one day want to come work there. And I think that could help grow diversity. I think uh, working with our colleges, uh, you know, working here with UMass Lowell. Who's interested in criminal justice? Who's interested in consumer protection? Want to come to an internship or have an experience there in the Attorney General's office? Um, they don't working do that with now. our law schools. I mean, we do that with law schools. Okay, um, but not with and some with colleges, but okay. you know, I, I think that there are ways to expand that and amplify that. So I really want to be proactive about it, and you better believe it that you know, uh, when elected, uh, my 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 job will be to recruit, as I say, uh, from all corners of the state, and to make sure that we have the top talent, always merit based, always merit based, and um, you know that that was certainly my experience in the in the attorney general's office. It was all merit based hiring. Um, but uh, but that is very, very important to me. So, you know, are there any number of things we can do better? Absolutely. And that's why I'm running. You know, I, I, I always felt uh, during my time in the Attorney General's office that uh, you go home at the end of the day and uh, you'd feel... You said you'd feel, that, 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 was, that was That was actually... That was literal. That was actually, yeah. That's okay. When I went home... Uh, from a day's work, you always felt like there was more to do, and I was anxious to do more and to strive to do more um, in that office. Mm. Well, I think that, uh, that any questions, any more questions, Dave? Do you think this, this mandatory minimum gun law, it, doesn't, it seems to be the obvious way to help get rid of some of these 
guns and people who want them, but it doesn't seem to be being enforced like it should be. Well, I think you got to, you know, when you're talking about gun violence, there's so much that, that we've got to get on in terms of, you know, what's the root causes of some of this violence in the communities, which gets at the, the gang issue and breaking some of that uh, activity, you know. Um, and mandatory minimums alone aren't going to take care of that. Um, and, you know, unless you're doing the kind of community policing, uh, anti-gang intervention, um, you know, doing everything you can to work with law enforcement to get at the gun trafficking and stop it at its source, you know, the, the punishment and the prosecution on the back end is just that. You're never going to, you're never going to uh, stop or, or reduce gun violence, in my, in my view. Um, by by just you know a sentencing approach. So, you know that's why the the plan that I put out is is pretty comprehensive and detailed when it comes to, to ending gun violence. It's why I'm um, heartened by the new legislation in terms of some of the reforms and the tools it will give law enforcement. And I really want to roll up my sleeves and work very hard with chiefs and sheriffs and district attorneys' offices, um, organizations, uh, members of the faith communities. Uh, you name it, uh, because we should really have all hands on deck when it comes to, to ending gun violence uh, in our communities. You mentioned, uh, just on gun violence, you yeah. mentioned New Hampshire earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, a former police chief and rural caller in New Hampshire is doing it a little secret that so many guns can be purchased in New Hampshire with, with more, la you know, with not as many patrols and they all just come across, the, come across the state, come across the state line. So it would seem to me that if you want to bring in all the partners, you would certainly need to include New Hampshire. But Absolutely. Isn't that, that's all, it seems like an impossible task. Well, I'm not going to approach it that way. Right. No, you know, know I'm know, going to approach it that, okay. look, we've got a problem here. Um, you are acting and allowing businesses to act in ways that are irresponsible, not checking uh, bogus IDs mm -hmm. that are just fraudulent mm -hmm. on their face, and then, you know, allowing people to purchase 10, 20 guns every other week and bring them into our border to wreak havoc and do harm in our communities. So... You know, I'm going to be uh, proactive and forceful and engaged on this issue with others uh, in the state and, and outside of the state. And New Hampshire is a great example of where I would need to work. It's, you know, I, I've had the experience of working with other state attorneys general's office during my time in the attorney general's office on other issues. But it's the same model. You know, it's the same approach. And I think that, you know, as I say, we're all in it together um, when it comes to this issue, given, you know, what we see is the pipeline of, of guns being trafficked up from New York through Connecticut into to Massachusetts and across the state here east and down from New Hampshire. But how do you do that? I mean, they're making money off of this. And, you know, New Hampshire's live free or die. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, exactly. how do you do that? How do you say, you know, we want you to cut, you know, the, the source for our bad people to get drugs when they're going, hey, you know, that's the way it is. <laughs> Young people are getting killed in New Hampshire too, mm -hmm. believe me, right? And they're getting killed in Connecticut. It's it's this is not a problem, you know, specific to to, to Massachusetts. And I think, you know, um, um, any in law enforcement have an interest in seeing a reduction in violence in their communities and the use of illegal guns uh, in their communities. And that's what this is about. S some people in Lowell and other urban areas are thinking that uh, it's the judicial system that is working against us and, and from a, especially with juveniles uh, from the point that we keep putting on out this perception well there's no more room in prisons or any place else to put them. One counselor said we should change it around says there is room to put, put them in. There are places to put them in. We just had four uh, juveniles go on a, a, a housebreaking rampage where they broke into four different houses mm -hmm. okay just for kicks all right, and then uh, they went to a juvenile court, and they were released. You know, uh, first offense and stuff like that, and they were back out on the street. So you're talking and, leniency, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it just keeps happening. You know, time and time again, drug arrests. They go in, boom. They go out on the street again, and uh, there's no in and drug. Stuff. And it just these are the problems. Now, yes, the suburban uh, communities face some of that, mm -hmm. but they don't have it the way the urban centers have, right. and it's just like. Uh, you know, the, the, the judges, you know, just, they blame on the judge. I don't know if it's unfair to say that, but they say, that, you know, there should be a place, put these kids and, and, and uh, you know, treat them as the criminals that they are. 
and yet we're passing more lenient juvenile uh, laws all the time, and, uh, and yet we don't have those other programs to back it up, like substance abuse treatment yeah. uh, programs, like etiquette and civil uh, you know, so, so you could teach that civics, but uh, yeah, I was a product of that. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, so I mean, where do they fit in the equation? Yeah. The, the judicial part of this. When you talk about the law enforcement working with the DAs, <coughs> and that seems all fine. They're working hard, those people. But when their hard work at the at the Ooh. end of the day <laughs> goes before a judge, and they sit frustrated yeah. in the courtroom because all right, a continuance. That's the that's the that's the death knell for Lowell. A continuance, you know, that goes on every day. Am I right, Lisa? Yeah, yes. Okay. I can tell you from first. I can tell you okay. from Lowell cops complaining to me about judges at Lowell District Court about just extraordinary leniency. Okay, Chief, let's go on the record. And I'll do a story on it. Oh my God, we can't do that. You know, they're petrified of the step on of, toes. Of, of the retribution. I heard it from Davis, I heard it from LaValle, and I heard it from Taylor. You know, all, was there another one in there? Um, all those guys, but they would, you know, given the opportunity to go on record as strips, they wouldn't touch it. Well, you know, you are, you are absolutely right that courts are part of this. And, you know, one of the things that I've said is I'd love to um, sit down with the head of our district courts, the trial courts, um, the housing courts, the probate and family courts, um, who are dealing with large dockets and a revolving door. You know, as I said earlier, my interest is in problem solving uh, and, uh, and doing what is best for the public and the public good. And so I'm really interested in rolling up my sleeves. This is hard work. This is hard work. You know, identifying and having conversations with court personnel, with probation, with judges. What are they seeing? What's working? What do we need to fix here? Why do these kids keep coming back? And how can I, as Attorney General, be a resource or help? using the, the, the power and the tools of that office. This is exactly the kind of stuff that I want to engage in and hear about because, you know, I run because I know that there are certain things that aren't working, but I have an interest in, in trying to get after that and, and fix it. And, you know, these are, um, these, are, uh, these are issues, as I say, that, you know, have a lot of components uh, to it, which is why, you know, my inclination is to, to make sure everybody's at the table, accountable, uh, and that we're having that really direct communication about what we need to do. <clears throat> and, you know, I think I bring with me a perspective that is open to that and can actually, you know, help implement and exercise. Were you in favor of raising the juvenile age to 17? Good question. For? So that anybody 17 and under was considered a juvenile? Um, you know, I, I didn't have an, a, a chance to evaluate that at the time, um, but yes, uh, would be my reaction. I mean, I think we've seen a lot about, uh, and I've had some personal experience, like doing hate crimes, uh, school bullying, uh, issues with, with kids. I mean, you know, there's evidence out there about the, the development of, of a juvenile mind. <laughs> and some would say it doesn't happen until 25, we're not fully formed. So. You know, but then why not raise it twenty five? No, no. I mean, but I, I kind of thought I it was an arbitrary. I think move. that's a. I think that there's a, a fair point about um, you know at some point you're just going to be you're drawing a line, yeah. and the question is where's where's an appropriate place to draw a line? And to me, you know, that seems like an appropriate place to draw a line. Okay. Well, Maura, I want to thank you very much for coming. Can I ask today. one more question? Mm -hmm. One more question, Lisa. Death penalty. Where do you stand? I'm opposed. Why? Uh, on a number of grounds, um, uh, on moral grounds, when it comes to the state taking a life, I have a problem with that. I think we've seen problems historically in terms of wrongful convictions or wrongful executions, uh, so I have concerns from a civil rights, civil liberties perspective. And, uh, you know, from an economic perspective, death penalty trials uh, and death row are incredibly expensive to the taxpayer. So I stand uh, opposed to the death penalty. Uh, it's not to say that uh, when people do bad things and these death penalty cases involve really horrific, egregious circumstances where uh, you know, it's just awful what happens, um, that we shouldn't bring to bear and, and hold people accountable. 
Uh, I just don't think that putting them to death is, is the way we should go. Okay, so even with horrific crimes, though, you're not in favor of the death? Penalty. Right, under, it, right. Okay. Well, we haven't wrongfully put anyone to death since Sacco and Vincetti. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we can, we can uh, agree to disagree on that. That's good. Well, Maura, I want to thank you for coming in here today, uh, answering uh, questions candidly with us, and, uh, and uh, wish you the best going forward. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be heard. And as I say, I, uh, I'm here today to ask for your support and the endorsement of this paper. This is a region that, that uh, I have enjoyed coming to and visiting and spending time in uh, from the very beginning of this campaign. And it's a region whose needs uh, and concerns are, are concerns that uh, that I certainly you know want to, to, to address as Attorney General. We hope that Lowell becomes a satellite office. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was for our home court program, the anti foreclosure program.